Some of us are still going through those things. Some of us have to take a day at a time to see where it's going to go next. Um, I've never experienced what I'm experiencing these days, dealing with my mother. It's probably one of the most difficult, frustrating things, tear-jerking things I've ever had to deal with. And, and I, I look out at you, and I know many of you have dealt with this already many times. And, but this is, my, this is my first time. And uh, you know from things I've said in the past, that uh, my mom and I are very close. I didn't go through this with my dad. My dad, uh, he had heart trouble most of, most of his life. And so when he got sick there at the end, we knew he was probably going to go, and he did. <coughs> and uh, there, it wasn't long and drawn out. He didn't have Alzheimer's. He didn't have dementia. He just got sick and couldn't handle it anymore, you know. But with my mom, uh, my dad passed away 20 years ago. My mom's been alone, and, and uh, my sisters and I, we've been her family, and, and uh, this new sickness that has come on her and this thing, you know, it's not just for her. So I am distracted, and I apologize for that, but just pray for my mom, just like we pray for each other here. We've always done that. Praise God. God is good. Amen. If you are just joining us for the first time, uh, today, uh, my style of preaching is that I find a book in the Bible and I go through it verse by verse. And we are presently in the book of Jude, and Jude is a very extraordinary book. It's only one chapter. And we've already dealt with several issues in Jude. Today, we are going to read verses 8 through 13, and we've already talked about angels once. In, in earlier verses, we're going to be talking about an angel again today, so I think you're going to enjoy this, but it's going to give a lot of history today. In um, verse 8, it goes, yet in the same manner as these men. Now, when it says these men, it's talking about what we've already dealt with in chapter 1, the, um, the enemies of the Hebrews in um, Egypt, uh, the people at Sodom and Gomorrah. The, the problems that God has had to deal with over the years. And he's referring to that. Yet in the same manner these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. That word angelic majesties or that phrase, we're going to come back to that and look at that some more. In verse 9, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them! For they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men, who, those, uh, uh, these men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. When they feast with you without fear, airing for themselves clouds without water, carrying uh, along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, unrooted, and wild waves in the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. What we're going to be doing with this passage of scripture, today I'm going to be dealing basically with verses 8 and 9. We're going to come back next week and we're going to deal with verse 11 and deal with Cain, and then the next week we're going to deal with Balaam, and then the next week we're going to deal with Korah. But today we're going to focus on what he's talking about here, yet in the same manner these men. And then in verse 9 where he says, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses. Do you remember seeing anywhere in scripture where it says anything about Michael and the devil arguing and disputing and fighting over the body of Moses? It's not in there. 
It's not in there. Now, how many of you have heard of apocryphal books? The apocrypha. Amen. Okay. These are books that have been <coughs> written down through the ages by holy men. But when they put together the canon, which is the collection of letters and books that we have in the Bible, there were some books that were not included because they didn't feel they were totally from the Lord or there was some question about them, so they were left out, but they were kept in a collection. And they are called the Apocryphal Books. We know by what we read here that Jude had read those books because he refers to something that is in the Testament of Moses. Have you ever heard of that book? It is one of the Apocrypha. We know that Jude read that. And he read that Michael the Archangel disputed with the devil over the body of Moses. So the question it has to be asked, why in the world would the devil want the body of Moses? What was the point? What was he trying to do? Why did Michael, Michael of all people, why did God send Michael to deal with this issue? Something very interesting about Michael. In all of the Bible, there is only one archangel. He is the angel that is in charge of all the other angels. And we, we hear of Gabriel. Um, in, in the Apocrypha, there's another angel listed, Raphael. In uh, Isaiah, Lucifer is mentioned, because Lucifer was an angel. But Michael was over all of them, and over the hundreds of thousands, probably even millions of angels that God created and is in heaven and in the earth and in the space, watching over us, taking care of us, helping us, guiding us, directing us, protecting us. But Michael, he's the archangel. There's nobody more powerful than him except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So God sent him when he realized that the devil, now who's the devil? Satan. Lucifer. Satan. Another angel. But a fallen angel. And see, we've already been shown in scripture, and we know that the devil, Lucifer, Satan, cannot defeat Michael. Michael is the champion. He is the head warrior. God has given him more power than any of the other angels, and so they were disputing. So, the only thing that it leaves us to is speculation. Why in the world would the devil want the body of Moses? Well, Moses had been with the children of Israel all through the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. He went to Egypt. He managed with God's direction and God's help to get them out of Egypt. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, so we've done it in detail. You recall that Moses led them out of Egypt, and they came to the Red Sea, and God parted the Red Sea for them. They went across, the Bible says, on dry land. They got to the other side. The Egyptian army chased them and followed them, and when they got out to the middle of it, the Red Sea closed again, and they were all drowned. Now, if you think that's a fable or a fairy tale, archaeologists have found in the middle of the Red Sea, underwater, deep down, chariots, swords, old wheels, old weapons, bones, it's all there underneath the Red Sea. It happened. And by the way, while I'm on that subject, because I, I love archaeology and I love those kinds of things, if you ever wonder if, if Noah and the ark uh, it was a, a fairy tale or a falsehood. They know where the ark is. It's on satellite pictures on a mountain in Turkey. It's broken in half and part of it has slid down the hill in a glacier, but it's there. Now a lot of people say, yeah, right. yeah, okay. So, but listen, I know. And you know that it's true. That's all that matters. God said it. God did it. That's enough. Amen. That's enough. Now, why did, why did the devil want Moses' body? 
Moses was the only leader these people had ever known. They had been in slavery for 450 years. Generations had passed. They had no one except they knew that hard work and sickness and death and under the foot of the Egyptian slave drivers. Along comes Moses. He removes them from Egypt. Literally, by the power of God, reduces Egypt to their knees. Leaves them in a heap to the point to where they were glad to get rid of the Egyptians because they knew that God had brought this down on them. So wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Moses was also the man that went up into the mountain and brought down what? The Ten Commandments, the law. And he taught them the law. And he ministered to these people. Moses was the one that God showed how to build the tabernacle. Moses saw to it that the tabernacle was constructed the way God wanted it constructed. That the priestly order was set up the way God wanted it set up. It was all Moses, Moses, Moses. God chose him to be the leader, to do all these things. Frankly, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. He obviously had to be, have, have the strength of God and his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam, I'm sure, helped him. But he did a lot that literally established the people of the Hebrews back on the map because they've been out of circulation for 450 years. And now they're back and they're going to be going into the promised land. He's all the people knew. He was almost like a mini-god to them. He could do no wrong in their eyes. They, they loved him and they feared him. Which is exactly why the devil wanted his body. Because you see, these people had all come from Egypt. And while they were Hebrews, they had the, he the Egyptian culture pounded into them. And they were aware of their ancestor worship. They were aware of how they would mummify their leaders, knowing that they would be coming back, you know, thinking they would be coming back. And so they looked at Moses as this kind of person, like their own personal Pharaoh. And in Egypt, the Pharaoh was God. Amen. So, I, I believe, and many, many theologians believe this, the devil had an idea, if I could get the body of Moses and get them to believe that he is their new God, that he will follow them, ultimately following me, Satan was saying. Do you remember when the plague broke out and uh, God told Moses, to make a serpent and put it on a, a rod and to hold it up in the assembly. And what did he tell the people to do? He says, look, look at the serpent. Now that seems a little strange to me, but then I'm a little strange myself, I guess. But they looked to the serpent and what happened? They were healed. They were healed. And people were healed in mass as they looked at the serpent that was being held up because God used that as an object of faith. God says, you look at that, God says you will be healed. Amen. Do you know that 400 years later, that serpent was still around and there was an occult within the Hebrew people still worshiping that serpent? Because that's the way they were put together. They wanted to see something they could worship. They wanted to be able to handle it. They wanted to be able to look at it because that's what they knew. And God, our God, is the invisible God. We trust Him on faith. And we know Him through the person of Jesus Christ. And so Moses, I believe, the devil wanted to create as a figure of worship for the Hebrew people to steer them away from God. And to steer them in the wrong direction with their faith and their belief and the law and the word. God knew this. So God sends Michael and uses Michael to stop him from doing that. Now we know very little about the body of Moses. I think scripture just simply says God buried him somewhere and nobody knew where and that was it. Well, Michael stopped the devil from getting, the bubble, from getting Moses, and they moved on. But the interesting thing here that it says in Scripture is, and I want you to, I want you to see it, 
He did not pronounce against him a railing judgment that says the Lord rebuke you. That tells us something about the character of Michael and the permission of Michael and what Michael could do and not do. He could not curse Lucifer. That was not his job to curse Lucifer. Michael's job was to obey God and do what God told him to do to stop Lucifer, to stop the devil from doing what he was trying to do. And when he wouldn't, Michael just said to him, the Lord rebuke you. Today we would use something similar. We'd say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Amen. But he would not pronounce a railing judgment. A railing judgment in the Hebrew is the same thing as a curse. So there were some limitations. Because, see, it was not time for Lucifer to be destroyed and, and, and thrown into the lake of fire. God had a whole plan that still had to come together and, and be, come together. Now I want to show you, um, if you look at um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, because one of the interesting things about the book of Job and Peter's second epistle, there are some verses that are similar, and this is one of them. Now, let's see. I think we're starting in verse, in verse 10, but I want to go back just a little bit. Okay, for, let's start at verse 9. I don't think you have that, Dennis. I'm sorry. No problem. It says, then the Lord knows how. Listen to this now. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority, daring, self-willed, now listen to this, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Now we just learned a moment ago that reviling, a railing judgment, is like a curse. Peter says that when people fall into sin, and in this day with the, the heretics and the false teaching and all of the things, people would curse the angels as well as the heavenly host. That's a railing judgment. And Peter says they are guilty of that. Jude says that they are guilty of that. And actually, they sort of mention this in passing to go on to other things. But what's really interesting is we need to take note of this. Because I want to tell you something. What we say, God hears. 